Good morning. Good morning. I'm the star of services here today. Uh, a few announcements here. Uh, we want to remember Paul uh, Lemon in our prayers as he's dealing with his health concerns. And Christina's mom has the COVID along with 21 others in Eagle Point. Uh, Roberta Pickett is still feeling weak. And Karen Metz is feeling a little better. Uh, Stacy White's brother, Charles White, is now home and has a follow up in a few weeks for his treatment plan. Don't remember Janice Martin's brother, Dale White. Uh, he, his surgery is scheduled for January the 5th, and he's going to spread uh, his cancer has been spread to other areas. And Debbie Bernard's sister, Julianne, Julianne Dietrich, is feeling much better. We want to pray for Kim Holden, who had a stroke and is in a nursing home, and she was a co worker of Ann's. And we want to just remember all those who lost loved ones recently and keep everybody in your prayers. And uh, we just hope that everybody recovers from their sicknesses and you all help them with the feelings that they uh, deal with the loss of the loved ones. And is there anything else that needs to be announced? All of a for the anniversary cards. Okay, Connie. Thank you, everybody, for a grand anniversary party. And, oh, yeah, and uh, this is from Helen and West. Says, uh, they want to thank us for the beautiful Christmas basket that uh, was delivered yesterday. They appreciate the love and kindness. That's uh, from West Mill. And tonight, or yeah, there'll be a drive through celebration after the evening service for Ben and Abby, and there'll be cupcakes and drinks that's tonight after the services. And uh, Thursday is Christmas Eve, Friday is Christmas Day, and we want to wish everybody a happy, healthy, joyful, and Merry Christmas. And just keep safe and enjoy the season. Anything else that needs to be announced in those days? Mark will be leading us on. Apparently, I can't read my own writing because I put the wrong number <coughs> up on the board, but it, 623 will be our first song. <coughs> what a friend we have.
Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 1, um, verses 18 to 21. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary had, was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary your wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to thee in prayer this morning. We pray that you will be with us as we worship here this morning, that we can all become stronger Christians and edified and hopefully go out here to the world and teach the word and gain souls and bring it to thy hope. We pray that you will be with the sick, that you will give them the care that they need, that they can come back and worship with us again once more. We pray that you will uh, be with us as he presents his lesson and he will have a well remembrance of the things which he is studying. We pray that you will forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Number six. <clears throat> Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he be both that sacred head for such a one as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I
precious faith to worship our God and Savior and Spirit of Truth. And one of the acts of worship is to surround this table and partake of the emblems that he instituted on the night he was betrayed. The bread, which represents his body that was hung on the cross and bore the sins of all mankind. And the fruit of the vine, which represents his blood that washes away the sins of the world. In John 3.16, is probably the most famous passage of scripture in the Bible. It says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes should not perish but should have everlasting life. I'd like to read a few verses this morning from 1 Peter, or I'm sorry, 2 Peter chapter 1. Uh, starting in, uh, in verse uh or the second half of verse one. To those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. When I was a young man, I, uh, I believed that God the Father created the heavens and earth and everything therein, in six literal days. I also believe that Jesus was his son and that he gave his life a sacrifice to pay the sin debt for all of mankind. I believe that very firmly, very strongly. And I knew what sin was. Uh, and to some degree, I, I knew what God expected of us. But I was powerless to overcome sin because I had not yet become a Christian. But we have become Christians. We have obeyed that form of doctrine that was delivered to us. We believe in God. We believe also in, in our Savior, Jesus Christ. And because of that faith, we have the hope of heaven. And we just hold fast to the end. Remember this sacrifice. And every day, deny ourselves take up our cross, and follow Jesus. Let's give thanks now as we partake of the bread.
Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this opportunity to come together to worship you and to partake of this bread, Father, that represents the body of, of our Lord and Savior that was sacrificed on our behalf. Pray, Father, that you would bless us as we partake of this. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Let's continue our faith in the fruit of the vine. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this, for this opportunity to, to come together to remember your great love for us, Father, the great love that Jesus had for us and all that he endured without complaint, Father, that, that we might be reconciled to you and have the hope of life eternal with you in heaven. Bless us, Father, as we partake of this fruit of the vine that represents the blood of your son, Father, that washes away the sins of the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you missed it, uh, just as you exit the uh, auditorium, there's a table back there with a basket for your offering. Song will be number, <clears throat> excuse me, number sixty five. Dark and dreary be life's way, and burdens hard to bear. There's one whose love will never fail, my heart shall never despair. My hope is stayed in him. And he will safely lead to that sweet home beyond the sea. Christ's love is all I need. Christ's love is all I need each day. I know. Oh, 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 oh,
So I'm, uh, according to my mask here, Santa Claus must be coming because he's already come to my mask. And he'll bring us good things, I think. When we think of this time of the year, it's my favorite time of the year. I, I Ever since I was a kid, this has been my favorite, uh, kid's favorite time of the year because you get lots of stuff. Um, and so it's always been my favorite time of the year, even though there's been some some struggles during this time of the year. But uh, I want us to think back at, as the world would think on a day or a week like this week. And, and I understand that when we think about the birth of Jesus, there's certain things that kind of catch us up. Is it really this time of the year? And there's some argument that it, it may not be this time of the year and, and things like that. And do we celebrate Jesus' birthday? And, and no, we don't celebrate Jesus' birthday because it's not commanded in the Bible. Um, but we do need to look at the virgin birth, whether we do that in June or December. And But what's really important is the world is begins to be, for the most part, begins to be focused on two parts. Well, the Santa Claus part of Christmas, but also much of the world begins to be focused on the Jesus part of the world, of, of the of Christmas, if you will. And, and, and I don't want to take any time that anyone is willing to focus anything on Jesus. I, I really don't want to overshadow that and, and say, well, you can't do that because Jesus was not actually born this time of year. We're not told in the Bible to celebrate his birthday. For a matter of fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're told to celebrate, if you will, his death, burial, and resurrection, the gospel of Jesus. And that's what we just, just did just a few moments ago and looked at the, that important part. But yet, if he wouldn't have come to this earth the way he did, as we'll see this morning, then we wouldn't get to really celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So I don't want to take anybody's thoughts away from Jesus. I don't want to steer them the wrong way, but anytime the world is willing to think of Jesus, that's probably a good thing. Because much of the time, it, we don't think of Jesus, or the world doesn't think of Jesus. And, and so the miraculous con concept and virgin birth of Jesus are important pillars of Christian faith. And this morning we're going to look at five of those pillars quickly, and some are longer than others, but we'll look at five of these pillars. And, and first, as we look at these, the virgin birth was a divine act. It was a divine act. The coming of Jesus in the world was the result of God's grace and his actions. It was the result of God's grace. God was the one making this happen. And it was because of God's love for us. We know it's John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's because of God's love for us. You see, we can trace this all the way back to the Garden of Eden, can't we? When, when Adam and Eve walked in the garden and there was, there was sin, Satan reared his head and at first, Eve took of the, the forget, forbidden fruit and ate of it. And then she gave that forbidden fruit to her husband and he ate of it. And from that point on, sin was in the world. And there had to be a solution for sin, a sacrifice for sin, an atonement for sin. And the only satisfying sacrifice or atonement was Jesus Christ. You could use a bull or a goat or some type of animal, but, but that would not take, pay the price of the penalty of sin. So it had to be a sacrifice like Jesus. But we see in Ephesians 2 and verses 8, and 8, 9, and 10, that for by grace you've been saved through faith, and it's not of your own doing, it's the gift of God, not as a result of work, so that one may boast, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good work, which God prepared for us. Uh, beforehand that we should walk in them. So we're God's preparation, if you will. God has prepared us. This is all, Jesus being born a virgin is all part of God's plan. Now, some people think that God works this way. He kind of works like us. We're made in the image of God. Sometimes we do things last minute, if you will. Well, what do I need to do right now for the next five minutes? Or the next day, or the next hour? 
and, and we plan accordingly, but God planned this out. He planned that man would probably sin, and there had to be a sacrifice for that sin. Man could do nothing to save himself. There's nothing we can do ever to save ourselves. We have to rely on God. And, and the introduction of Jesus was not the result of, of a couple getting together, if you will, desire to have children or, or, or anything like that. It was a miracle from God and carried out by the Holy Spirit, a divine representative to our, our response to our human needs. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place this way. It's important. It took place this way with the mother. And, and, and the reason this story leads two of the Gospels out, Matthew and Luke really, is because it's so important. It, it would be interesting if, if these authors started with the death, wouldn't it? But no, they start with the birth and they go through the life and they go to the death of Jesus, just like we would start something like that, where we always start at the very beginning and go through the lifespan and go to the end. Now, the birth of Jesus place took this place took place this way when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph. Now, this is kind of like an engagement. We mentioned this before, but it's so much more. You're almost considered married, but but it's just shy of the wedding day. And before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Now, to, to, if you're betrothed, it's kind of like we would call engagement. But the only way out of betrothal in those days was divorce. And, and so this is a serious relationship between Mary and Joseph. But all of a sudden, it's, she's found to have a, a child. You can imagine how, how Joseph must have felt. We see in Luke 135, Luke's version, Dr. Luke tells the story, the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called, be called Holy, the Son of God. So this child is going to be something special. But secondly, we see that the virgin birth was the fulfillment of prophecy. Not only was it a divine act, but it was prophesied from, from the very beginning, was mentioned in many New Old Testament books. And, and we see in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, uh, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is God with us. So that's the New Testament prophecy there of the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. Through the coming of Christ, God fulfilled his promises to secure the descendants of David. This goes all the way back to the David and, and David on his throne. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, to verses 12 and 13, we see the Lord said to Nathan, the prophet, to go tell David, that says, when your days are filled and you lie down with your fathers. In other words, David, when, when, when you're done, with life, and you go to the grave. The Lord says, I'll rise up your offspring after you, and who shall come from your body. And I will establish his kingdom. Now it's important because David was a king when he was an earthly king. And he shall build a house for my name, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Well, who's the Lord talking about? He's talking about Jesus, isn't he? This is an Old Testament prophecy through David about Jesus. Now we see David come up again there in Peter's first sermon on the day of Pentecost. We see as Peter preaches, he says, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us today. Can you imagine standing over the, the, the grave side of David? Say, in this grave is David. We, we know about him. He was a great and mighty warrior. He was a great and mighty king. We know that he lived and he died and there lies his body. Well, that's important because this one here, this one that was born of Mary, this one that was born of a virgin is different. And Peter says, being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had shown, shown with, 
an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on, a th on his throne. He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up that of and of that we are witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing, for David did not ascend into heavens, but said to him, or but himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, as I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel know, therefore know, for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. This is just about 50 days after they have hung Jesus on the cross, almost exactly 50 days. Peter says, remember 50 days ago with you, that's less than two months. It, it's, it's not like David. Yet you see, this one that you put in the grave, this Jesus, God has made him both Lord and Christ, Savior. And he's the one you've crucified. Well, thirdly, not only is it a divine act, not only was it fulfilled in prophecy through Isaiah and so many more, but the virgin birth accounts for Jesus' pre-existence. Now, I want you to think about this. Many people think, well, if you ask the question on the street, one of, one of the Jay Leno questions or something, when was Jesus, when did Jesus come to earth? Most would say, well, he was born of Mary, and you know, we have the story in Matthew, and we have the story in Luke, but when did Jesus come to earth? Well, there was a, a pre-existence of Jesus that, that sometimes we really don't think about. For a matter of fact, we see here in John chapter 1, verses 3 through 4, in the beginning was the word. Now, this word here is logos in the original language. L-O-G-O-S, logos. Means word or Jesus. In the beginning was Jesus, the Word, Logos. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. Without Him was nothing made, or was not anything made that was made. So we see here, and John opens his book. Now, John is a, a synoptic gospel, that means he's different. The word synoptic means he's different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. If you, if you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, same stories many times are, are repeated over in those Gospels. John is over here. He's, his Gospel is a little bit different. John is the apostle that, that's known as the apostle that Jesus loved. And, and we have him over here saying this. Look, don't look necessarily look at, at Jesus coming from that virgin birth. Look at Jesus being here when? From the very beginning. In the beginning was God, or the Word, the Word was with God, the word was God. In other words, we see the very beginning when we turn to Genesis chapter one to verse one, we see that word for, for, for God there, and that's Yahweh, and that means Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They were all there at the day of creation. They had all been planning creation. So we see a pre-existence of Jesus. The fact that Jesus came into this world miraculously meshes with the fact that he has always existed. Fourthly, we see that the virgin of birth explains how Jesus could be fully God and fully man. You say, well, if he was here, if he pre-existed, if he was fully God, if he's responsible for creation, if he was there in Genesis 1 verse 1, how did he come as a man in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18 and following. How can he be both God and man? Well, we look at John again and we see John chapter 1 and verse 14, and the word became what? Flesh. He doesn't, John doesn't waste much time before he begins explaining this. He starts in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, same with the beginning of God, all things were created, the end of were created. Then he goes to verse 14, and the word became flesh. That same word, logos, up there that we see in John 1, 1, 
John 1, 2, and John 1, 3, it became flesh. Well, what is flesh? Flesh is like you and I. It hurts when you poke it. It hurts when you stick it. It hurts when you hit it with a hammer. He became just like you and I. And then he did this. He dwelt among us. Now we think of God as someone up there in as a spirit, God is spirit. John would tell us that in chapter 4, verse 35. And, and we see God as a spirit. We think of him as a spirit, living up as a spirit life. But then when we think of God, do we think of him in the flesh? And that's what we see here for some 33 years is Jesus, God, in the flesh. And, and, and he dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. In other words, if you've seen Jesus, you've seen who? God. If you've seen God, you've seen who? The Holy Spirit. The three in one, you've seen them there. Now Mary, a human, miraculously conceived a child through the agency of the Holy Spirit, God. You put a human together with God and we come up with Jesus here. And he's being divine and human at the same time. Uh, Paul would say in the book of Philippians chapter 2 verse 6 and 7, though he was in the form of God, he did not count, consider himself equal with God, a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant, being born in the likeness of men. I know this version here, ESV, just says servant, but many other versions say bondservant. There was bondservant as the lowest form of servant you can be. Think of a servant, someone who's serving you. And then you have that lower form, and that's what Jesus became. He came from the right setting at the right hand of God in heaven, came to this earth for you and I, and became a, the lowest form of a servant that he could be. He, he's not only the son of David, but he's also the son of God. And he is Emmanuel, God with us. Well, Fifthly, this morning, and lastly, first, he's a divine, it's, it was a divine act. Secondly, him being born of a virgin was a fulfillment of prophecy. It had to happen because if it didn't happen, then, then the Bible wouldn't be true. Remember the old song, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the, what? Bible tells me so. This is, this is why I believe that Jesus loves me because I believe in the Bible. So if the, the prophecy was never fulfilled, then we couldn't believe in the Bible. But the prophecy, when we see, see, that's how we can test the Bible. Well, we decide, well, I'm not sure the Bible is real. I'm not sure the Bible is true. We go back and test it. Look at every oath with the study to do this. It's not just saying, oh, okay, I'm going to believe somebody. I have to study. I have to work to do this. I go back and look at every single prophecy in the Bible and see if that prophecy has come true. If I find one prophecy in the Bible that has not come true, then I can say, I can throw out the baby with the bathwater, so to speak. But when you go through and you study every single prophecy, every single prophecy has come through, and certainly the virgin birth of Jesus was a fulfillment of one of those prophecies. Thirdly, it accounts for his pre-existence. Fourthly, the virgin birth explains how Jesus could be fully God, fully man. But lastly, the virgin birth complemented by Jesus' resurrection and ascension into heaven. It's complemented by that. After Jesus came into the world miraculously, he also left it. Here about some 33 years. His death, he was raised the third day after a powerful feat which testifies of his divinity. We see in Romans chapter 1, verse 4, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer. That's the wrong verse. Romans chapter 1 and verse 4 was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. So after 40 days of showing himself to, to, to witnesses, eyewitnesses, can you imagine? Can you imagine that? Now, now the last couple of books, of chapters of Matthew really talk about that well. Jesus dying, we, we can understand someone dying, can we? We see that quite often. And, and after you die, 
we bury or cremate you. In this case, Jesus was buried. But that rising from the dead really kind of gets us, doesn't it? That's a little different. And then how do you know that he rose from the dead when, when so many people saw him? Paul would say in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that, that he was seen by Cephas and, and, and over 5,000 people or 500 people. We see in Luke chapter 24 and verse 51, or 50 through 51, when he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethlehem, he, he lifted up his hands and he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Followed by Acts chapter 1, verse 9, when he had spoken these things while they watched. Can you imagine you're just kind of in awe that Jesus died and was buried and raised? Wow, is that the same guy that died on the cross? That, that's Jesus. Wow, we can't believe it. He, you know, he really is the Son of God. And, and then all of a sudden you see him. 40 days later, he was taken up and, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And, and while they looked steadfastly towards heavens as he went up, behold, two men stood there in white, a pair of white garments, who also said, Men of Galilee, why are you stand gazing into heaven? This same Jesus who's taken from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. We are waiting for that promise today. We are waiting for him to come in like manner as he went up into heaven. Right, or 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 18 tells us that will happen. When the trump of the Lord shall sound the dead, Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air. How did he go up? He went up in the cloud in the air. We'll be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. There is the promise we see from, from Acts chapter 1 to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. You see this, that promise is the resurrection. Had he not been born, both God and man, had he not had the virgin birth, none of this would have ever been Possible, but you have to ask the question, why? Why? Why did God go to the trouble of planning all this? Why did Jesus go through the trouble, if you will, of, of going from this elevated position of being the creator up at the right hand of God to coming to this earth to, to be a, a servant to where he would wash Peter's feet that he would suffer and die a horrible, horrible death. Why? Well, we'll close as we look at Tim, or excuse me, Titus chapter 2 and verses 11 through 4. He, he did it for you and I, didn't he? He did it for Adam and Eve. He did it for no, he did it for Moses. He even did it for Judas. Even though it's Judas betrayed him, he did it for Judas. He, he did it for every living human being that's ever been born because God wants us all to be saved. Look at Titus. Paul would say this to Titus, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. I want you to think about this for a second before we continue reading that. Salvation. Salvation, you know, in other words, being saved. It, it, it's, it's different in different situations. Uh, picture yourself on a boat. Now maybe, I know some of you know how to swim. But how good a swim, uh, swimmer are you? I remember a, a big boat, and I saw a picture just a, yesterday, I think it was, last night of a boat that was very similar looking. But this big boat that I'm thinking of was called the Titanic. Remember that boat? What would never happen to the Titanic? It would never, ever, what? Sink. That's what, that's the way it was, was this, this big, wonderful boat. And it was interesting because they had the, the fancy class up top, and I think they had even a little bit of middle class, and then they had the poor people down like in the dungeon in the bottom of the boat, and everybody separated. Groups. Kind of like this world does sometimes. And, and, and 
This was a boat that couldn't sink. That's the last thing anyone that got on the boat thought about is their salvation. But when they hit the iceberg, in the hours after that, that was what every single person on that boat thought about was their salvation. How can I be saved from this catastrophe? Some were not, many were not. Some were able to get onto a lifeboat and be rescued hours and hours later. The ones that were able to go into the water, the water was freezing, freezing cold, were not able to last very long on all of them, basically, except for a few that I know of, froze to death. So I don't think swimming will really help you. We don't think of being saved much, do we? But we really need to be saved sometimes, don't we? If 2020 has shown us anything, it's that we need a loving God. Sometimes we get so wrapped up in how crazy the world is, and all the things that are going on, and all the things that we, we figure will happen in the future, and, and sometimes we just have to stop and realize that we need a loving God, and if Christ would have not have come, we wouldn't have that loving Jesus, if you will, to save us from our sins. So Paul would tell Titus, and I thought Paul was back there, sorry, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. God, through Jesus Christ, has brought salvation to everyone. So it wasn't so that wasn't the case on the Titanic, was it? It was the you know, if you could just the fittest, if you will, would be saved there. Training us, I want you to notice this. Training us to renounce ungodliness worldly possessions. In other words, it's, it's not just a process we come up out of the water, oh, I'm, I'm holier than thou, I'm, I'm a Christian, I'm, I'm perfect. No, that's not the case. Christians are, are not perfect. But we're in a training program, if you will, to renounce ungodliness and worldly possessions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age where we're at today, waiting for our blessed hope. We just talked about the hope of Jesus coming and appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Christ who gave himself for us. Why? To redeem us from the law of lawlessness, to purify for himself a people for his own possession. This, this salvation and this training that, that God puts us through is to purify us so that we can be God's own possession why? Who are zealous for good works. He wants us to see the things that we can do for people in this world while we're here. But God sent his son to save us. Sometimes we're like people getting on that boat. We don't realize we need to be saved. But we do, don't we? We do. I want you to imagine this for just a second, and we'll close. Imagine that you're living your life the way you're living your life right now. And the trump of God sounds. It might be kind of interesting because you might see the dead in Christ rising. If you ever see someone rising up, a body rising up from the grave, that, that would be kind of interesting. I don't know if we'll figuratively see it or literally see it. I, I don't know. That's what the Bible says, the dead in Christ will rise first. And we who are alive will be caught up together to meet the Lord in there. When that trump of God sounds, I better be what? Right with God. I better have my life. Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. This morning, the invitation is yours. Won't you come? Let's stand. Let me say. Oh, most persuaded, now do we.
glad to see everyone out this morning. We hope to see everyone back this evening for evening worship. Is there anything else? We pray for um, Ben and Abby because they'll be driving over from Kentucky to get here. So. Okay. Remember Ben and Abby in your prayers for safe travel uh, as they'll be traveling from Kentucky here this afternoon. Um, I'd like to thank Elvis for another good lesson from God's Word. Is there anything else? Yeah, I'd like to announce that uh, there's one more week of services like we've had the last couple of weeks. And starting with the new year, uh, services will go back to normal. Okay. So bow with me. We'll have a prayer and we'll be dismissed. Our Father in heaven, we're so grateful for this day that you've given us. We're thankful, Father, that you been with us, that you've kept us safe through this pandemic. We pray, Father, that you will continue to be with us. Help us, Father, to reach out to those around us to, to show them your glory and your grace. We pray, Father, that you will give us safe passage to our homes, that you'll bring us all back at the next point in time. And it's through Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.